Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Bullship with Bill and Matt. Uh, today's episode is going to be a really fun one, uh, sticking in a holiday theme. Bill, do you know anything that we're going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about two things. I'm guessing that at least one of them is Thanksgiving or holiday related because you want to post it on Thursday, which is Thanksgiving, for some bizarre reason known only to you at this moment. So that's really that, yes. that's the extent of my knowledge. Chaos is totally my brand. I am really for it. So on, the, on we've discussed in episodes that are totally going to stay in the vault forever. That really is sort of my brand. You are a D and D player. My my character alignment is probably tending towards like chaotic neutral, if not chaotic good. Most of the time, I find that's like really my sweet spot. I was going to say the same thing for you. In fact, um, we my wife and I often talk about this that there are kind of chaos muppets and order muppets and i would definitely describe you as the chaos muppet of the two of us i'm clearly the the order muppet i'm the kermit you are the <laughs> in, the miss piggy in terms the of like, animal the whatever you want in terms of comedians i feel like we were a good pair uh you you have really nailed down the like bob hope like just kind of impartial lines like very very calm very like that stutter that you got is really it's really solid um so don't please don't change it now that i've mentioned it uh and mine probably closer to jerry lewis i would say i'm less the straight man more of the the comedy action which is great uh so yeah bill you you're in for a trip today um, but speaking of being a chaos puppet i wanted to let you know how how cold is it up where you are right now in massachusetts it's, I mean, it's late November. I think it's appropriate. It's probably 40s or so right now. Okay. It's really okay. good. We took the dogs for a walk this morning. It was great. Beautiful. So down here, it was like 60. It has been colder. Uh, the house that I'm living in currently has a pool. Um, and on Sunday, I was like, it's time to go for a dip. So it was beautiful. It was like 70 degrees outside, 64, 70 degrees. Kids were outside playing, having lunch. And I like went inside, changed into a swimsuit, and just ran outside and was like, "Here we go!" and like hopped right in. Scared them; they didn't know what was going on. And then they're like, oh, "I want to do that." So I told them like, "Okay, go!" Like they went and got swimsuits on. They came out; they were ready. And I, my, my two oldest, so my seven-year-old and my five-year-old, um, are both like, "We want to do it." I'm like, "Okay, here's the deal: if you think about it, you will not do this." Like, I, I promise you, like, this is not a good idea. And my wife was like, hey, the younger one of the two, the, your, your middle child, your boy, he's probably going to be very upset with you after he gets in the pool. <laughs> so I was like, okay, we'll, we're going to figure that out. So sure enough, we, like, got up and, like, hold hands, jumped in together. They very quickly skedaddled out of the pool. Um, and then we... Uh, the opposite happened with my son. He started really enjoying it um, and would just like unsolicited take hops into the pool. Like, I'm going to do this. Like, just just because he enjoyed the brisk waters. So, wow. We're very sad. I, 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 I can't imagine. It's, yes, it is not pool weather up here. Up here. <laughs> it's not pool weather down here. Up. It was cold. It was pretty cold. Yeah. Um, Good for you. You are a better man than I for jumping into the pool at 60 degrees with your kids. It's not something I would do. You might like it, Bill. You might. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't, actually. I I mean... I, I, I've been in cold water. We, I live in New England. I've jumped into the ocean. It's cold here. The, the ocean is cold on the best of days here. That's true. Yes. I, I know pretty factually that I would not enjoy that. <laughs> All right, so it's time to get down to business, Bill. We've done that, enough that chatter. That even wasn't one of the topics? Oh, my that God. Was not one of the, that, was, that was like extra credit, just like bonus on top. Just want to let you know, like, what we're doing down here in the theme of, like, me being a chaos puppet. This is what I'm doing in my everyday life, Bill. Dear listener, we are in for a wild ride today. Yeah, you sure are. So I have two topics. Again, as you have clearly described, they are both about Thanksgiving. They are both about the supply chain. Um, one and out. Both of them will relate to you in very different ways. So the first one, so I'm going to talk about the turkey supply chain. 
Awesome. Because it's Thanksgiving. And this will relate to you because it involves demand forecasting. I know you love that. Yeah. And the second topic is going to be about cranberries, which is a thing that you, Massachusetts, is that what we call you? That's what we call it. And that is where cranberries come from. I, there I, you I go. So we're going to talk about both of those. Chat with some folks from Ocean Spray just, uh, just over the weekend. Were you? Talking this, about. This story is about them. You might actually know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> That's the extent of my cranberry harvesting knowledge, actually. But um, they, they okay. said it's very, it's very like soothing, like Zen being in, in this bog full of cranberries just swirling all around you. I've heard there's also bog spiders and that they get, they like float on the water when it gets flooded and they can get into your waders. Could be. That is not Zen to me, though. That, that sounds like arachnopho arachnophobia sequel. Yeah, I got it real bad, Bill. I'm not going to lie to you. Right. That, that is totally a thing. I do not like spiders. Well, fr frankly, you live in Texas, so like you guys have much bigger, <laughs> more poisonous everything that we do here. So I, I, I would I would take our bog spiders over whatever snakes and scorpions you guys have down there. No, no, never. Okay, we need to get we, enough dilly-dallying and chitter-chatter. Right. It's time to talk about turkey. turkey supply chain, turkey demand forecasting. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a story. Both these stories actually come to me via Planet Money, which I highly recommend. They don't specifically talk about the supply chain, but they do kind of in ways because economics and supply chain really work together. So in 2023, sorry, 2022, um, which if you remember is post COVID, there was a Turkey shortage. And this is kind of wild to me. I do kind of remember doing that. Okay. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Yeah. All right. I mean, so, so what, what happened? So as you can imagine, the, the holiday of Thanksgiving is a huge, like, draw in the world of, like, turkey forecasting, right? So everyone's mm -hmm. trying to hit that date. Yep. And because turkey, to some extent, is a commodity, they're having to, like, plan and forecast out, like, a year in advance, right? Because turkeys have to be born and grow and, you know, yep. get to size at the right time. So around that time, and maybe it wasn't 22, I forget when it was, but it, it was a pandemic related thing. Um, the like 2020 Thanksgiving holiday, people were not buying turkeys. They just didn't. And so that like drew down the forecast. There were, unfortunately, there were a lot of excess turkeys in the American market that, that were horrible. Yes. They were dis dispatched. I think it's probably the nicest word that I can say for like what really happened. I think yeah. our very astute listeners will understand what I'm really trying to say there. Uh, so then the next year of 21, I think might've been better. It doesn't really matter. But then there was this other banner year because everyone was now flush with money from COVID area stimulus that the, the supply chain hadn't like popped back up to where it was. And so the yep. price of turkeys was insane, crazy high because it was like, we, we can't figure out what the American consumer wants. And so I, I, there, cause I also want to know, do you, and I don't recall, had the vaccine come out at that point yet? In 22 or 20 or Thanksgiving? You're talking, you're talking 21 right now, right? They had a banner year in 21. Yes. I'm pretty sure it had. Maybe it hadn't. I don't know. I forget when, when everything I'm just, happened. I'm just thinking about like the whole demand, right? Where is the demand coming from? Like the lack of demand in twenty in twenty twenty probably came from the fact that people were having tiny Thanksgivings or were probably having yes. chicken or something else instead, right? Because you don't want to buy a huge yes. turkey if you're only feeding four people. Yes. Right? But exactly. Then, then the vaccine comes out in twenty one, all of a sudden people are celebrating, right? Like Holy, yep. holy cow, we can be together again. Oh, holy turkey, right? Yes. Like, let's, yeah. let's have a turkey because we're feeding 20 people. And like, and like get a big one. So, yeah. like, yeah, when you would normally have like a 10, 15 pound turkey, people were like, let's go big, 20, 24 pounds. And like, there just wasn't enough because that turkey has to grow. It has to like get big enough to like, and then like go to market at the right time when it is that size. So yeah, it was kind of wild, like, Everything is crazy. Everything is upset. And then, so then like the next year after that, turkey farmers who had like, broadly, there were a lot of them had gone out of business after COVID. 
because they, they, you know, they had to dispose of a lot of turkeys. Um, there weren't enough producers to meet the demand and prices were sky high. Oh, wow. Um, so then like in their, their, they were just trying to figure out, so they, this is a continual thing. When you have a holiday that is so extremely associated with like specific foods, it really sways things when there is some other external market, like issue that like pulls it one way or the other. Yep. Yep. It's, it's, it's so there it's, you go. It's a really steep seasonality. And those are, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, it's just like, I, mean, I talked about this, I think last time we spoke, like I'm in the toy industry and we count on Q4, right? Like basically what happened is Christmas went away that year. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. So there you go. That was story number one. The other fun thing about turkeys is that I think they said like demand rises something like 800% around like specifically the two weeks of Thanksgiving. Um, but the price of turkeys actually reduces by 20% in grocery stores. And that's specifically because grocery stores are using it as a loss leader. I can see your face just amazed by this number. <laughs> um, because in the regular world of supply and demand, yep. when demand increases, then like price would increase as well. It doesn't because grocery stores are going to make the, their rest of their money. They're going to take a loss on the turkey. They're going to make the rest of their money on everything else you're buying, right? So your green bean casserole, your sweet potatoes, everything else, but everything else will rise commensurate with what they're expecting to gain. Come get your turkey here. And then, oh, by the way, you have to cook the rest of your meal. Nice. There you go. There you go. So that, I, that, that is a great Thanksgiving story, Matt. Thank you. A great I'm here for you. supply chain related. We're not done yet. There, there is a second half to this episode, Bill. There's, there's another one. Because when you eat turkey on Thanksgiving, you eat it with Cranberry sauce? I don't eat it with cranberry sauce. But we, we, we're going to pause there. We're going to pause right there okay. because we do have an advertiser that we need to plug. Do you have an advertiser that you want to plug? I do not yet, Matt. We're getting no, there. Okay, fantastic. One day. One of these days, Bill will get an advertiser. Until then, he will definitely never edit this podcast. But until he gets an advertiser, I will continue to plug our good friends at Amplifier, Amplifier.com. They are a 3PL. They do some of the best fulfillment <clears throat> of any 3PL I've ever met um, or been involved with. And this is news to Bill. They are actually doing fulfillment for me specifically uh, as my low budget logistics website. Nice. Uh, they do print on demand t-shirts and I have a print on demand t-shirt that should be available as of the recording of this podcast. Low budget logistics t-shirt? Well, I'm yes. going to go tell my wife what I want for Christmas. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. So you, your new thing to plug can now be me. I'm, I'm happy to, to advertise on this show. I was going to say, Low Budget Logistics should sponsor this show. I mean, if only they were making any money. <laughs> you're basically hosting it on our, on your, your YouTube channel anyway. <laughs> Anyways, all that aside, Amplifier.com for all of your 3PL needs. They are exceptional. Um, some of the brightest in the business. Okay, so Bill, are you ready now? I for story am number two? racing myself for cranberries. Okay, so you're from Massachusetts, which okay. I believe is the headquarters of Ocean Spray. Yeah, pretty sure. Okay, because I think that like most of the cranberry farming might have actually moved to Wisconsin. Is that right? You're you're already getting over my head. I and I feel like I should. I feel like I'm not representing my state right now. I know, but. Bill. Yeah, I've lost track of Come cranberry on. production in this country, but I know we do still make a lot of cranberries here in Massachusetts. Do do y'all take state history in in like junior high? No. Do, do you? What? We take Texas. Yeah. No, we take Jesus. like we, we take like American history. We so fourth grade. So I said junior high, and then elementary school. Fourth grade across the state statewide is texas history year this is the year you learn very specifically about texas history that is i had no idea no we don't i mean it, in fairness like we learned a lot about colonial era america which has a lot to do with that's fair a lot of yep yeah. yeah, a, a lot of stuff happened in massachusetts when texas wasn't even a state we were our own country bill thank you very much not at the point of colonialism, but we're and still are in uh, in many senses. The great state of Texas—that is correct. The only state 
and I know this because of state history, the only state that can legally fly their state flag at the same height as the United States flag. Amazing. I'm going to like edit out because of AI. I can now edit out the pauses, but I, I want to leave that one in because it was so pregnant of a pause of just like amazement in my knowledge of my wonderful state. I, I don't even know what to do with that bit of knowledge, but um, is that a Texas state law or did like they actually petition the U.S. government and say, hey, can we, can we get this into the, the federal statutes? Now, I don't know a lot about like federal flag law. I will be very honest with you. But I the the thought is, or at least the the oh, what is the right word for this? It doesn't really matter. The like going saying is that when Texas entered the union, right, they part of the like legal writing of the like entry was that as our own nation, we came in as an equal to the United States. And so we like dictated that we would always have the ability to like fly equal to the U.S. flag. So every other state has to fly it below it. You'll see this like if you look at stadiums and stuff and they have your state flag, the U.S. flag will always be higher than the state flag, except in the case of Texas where it's equal. Uh, I had, I had I mean, you are just full of wild and crazy facts. And this is true chaos Muppet podcasting here. <laughs> okay. So. Back to our regularly scheduled program, or at least what I want to call our regular program, Ocean Spray Cranberries, which are headquarters in Massachusetts, but although I personally think that production has moved otherwhere, elsewhere, Ocean Spray is an interesting thing because as a company, they are a consortium of farmers. Mm. So farmers got together and they right, decided to be, become a company, and that's like how it became a thing. Now, for years, many, many, many years, Ocean Spray's, like, primary thing that everyone bought all year was cranberry sauce. In the can, we all know exactly what that is. But then, then, in the 30s, which historical listeners will remember, was not a great time for the U.S. Again, very similar. um, Demand just went through the floor, either because... I think there might have been a really bad cranberry harvest and everyone knew about it and then no one had money anyways. So they just like, it just bombed. And a lot of cranberry farmers, again, went out of business. And the the folks at Ocean Spray very specifically went, we cannot be reliant on one product only. We can't, and like one product so tied to Thanksgiving specifically. We have to find a way to branch out. And so they went and said, What other products do we have? And they went, we have cranberry juice. Now, Bill is smiling right now. If you're not watching the going, Okay, go go on. Okay. Now, cranberry juice. If you have ever tasted 100% (laughs) cranberry juice, Bill Bill knows. It's terrible. It tastes so bad. Yes, it's terrible. Right? It's, It's bitter. It's tart. It's really bad. But for whatever reason, cranberry farmers drink this stuff. Really? I, I do not. That's, yeah, they do. I have no idea. Okay, that's crazy. Yes, because it is It is without a whole lot of sugar. It's terrible. It's it's so bad. It's like, oh, it's really biting. Um, yeah. Like, it's like soured, like bad wine. Yeah. It's so bad. If you look at like okay. the bottle of like, your cranberry juice at home, it is like, I don't, I don't know what, it's like 12% juice or something like that. And the rest is water and some... Yeah. And for me, even like, gosh, even drinking like regular, like ocean spray cranberry juice, it's still like, it still gets me. I'm not a big fan of it. Yeah. That's just me. Anyways. So they were like, well, we've got this cranberry juice. So let's, let's figure out a way to sell this to people. And we'll sell it year round. So again, in the thirties, this is like, I think prohibition might have been part of this thing as well. Uh, And Americans were looking for an alternative. (laughs) And they were like, great, we'll make the cranberry juice cocktail. And so they were like, let's mix cranberry juice, this terribly tart thing, with something else. We'll dump a bunch of sugar into it. And then maybe people will like it. And sure enough, like, bam, it caught fire. And now, like, the, like, needle swung the other direction where now Ocean Spray 
is primarily known as like a juice company and not as like a cranberry sauce company. So and, and I have to, is this then the origin of the Cosmopolitan? Because I, I thought that's where you were going with this. <clears throat> I have no clue. Uh, so, so, so I'm going to posit something here. And this is now, dear listener, this is not based on, on fact really in any way. But but back then, like cocktail, you had to make cocktails with your with your booze because because people were making booze in their bathtubs, right? And it was really harsh and hard to drink. And that's that's why that's why you make sweet cocktails is because like you just could not drink the stuff straight. And it, right. And so and this is news know, to me, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah, that's I, it, I'm sure there are other reasons why cocktails were made. But like back then, like cocktails were big because like you just had to cut the stuff. It was terrible. And and so I'm wondering if like the Cosmopolitan came about because because at the time they were like, cocktails were starting to be you know made more and experimented with because because Maybe. of prohibition and all the speakeasies and cranberry juice here comes and and Cosmo is just vodka cranberry juice and probably at the time simple syrup. I have never had a Cosmopolitan. Funnily enough, but... I happened to be in a cocktail class over the weekend, and they featured a Cosmo, which is really the only reason that this is coming to mind right now. This is all, this is, yeah, this is amazing. This is just like, the universe told us to make this podcast today. There you go. Those those are my stories, Bill. And supply chain is super involved in all of them. So now you can drink your fancy, you know, coastal elite Cosmopolitan knowing full well the, the deep story behind it of depressions and supply chains and, and trying to find a way to make cranberry juice palatable for a large portion of the United States. Awesome. Great, there you go. Great. This was great stories. I don't know how I'm going to top that one. I'm excited for what you might bring to the table now. Well, it, so it's, so we'll, we'll get, get to our supply chain chatter then. And it's actually, <laughs> funnily enough, it is kind of, Thanksgiving related as well, because it is about airlines and Southwest specifically, right? Boy. Uh, right? Yes. Are you about, I have a thought of what it is, but I'm going to be quiet. Okay. It's just an article I came across in the Times uh, the other day, because um, it's called How Southwest, how, yeah. Can you edit that? that? Nope. It's in. Southwest Airlines lost its groove. And I had no idea it had lost its groove, but apparently it's struggling lately. It just at reading, reading the article, a lot of it was related to their their operations um, and market dynamics too, especially post pandemic. But I just found some of the facts in here really interesting. But first of all, at their peak, they could turn around a plane in ten minutes, so they could get people That's off the plane. Crazy. Right? Can you imagine? That's so cool. Yeah, and that was that was really one of their big advantages was that they could just get people off, clean the plane up and get the plane moving again. So they could do more with fewer assets. They could make more flights with the same number of planes and other companies who are taking longer to turn their planes around. Although as a semi-frequent flyer, 10 minutes is not enough time for the seat to cool down. <laughs> and I'm like, I would then be sitting in a warm seat and that feels icky to me. Uh, well, but you were, but you were paying a lot less for that flight. So is that is that making this worth it? Anyway, that's I don't fly Southwest. Let me tell you that right now because I don't like being treated like cattle. So who's the elite snob now? Okay. <laughs> Texas does have a coast, so I guess I could be a coastal elite now. South Southwest is a Texas born airline. They started in Texas. I know. Shame on you. I'm familiar with I thought you're proud of everything, Texas. Anyway, so so they used to be able to turn around a plane in ten minutes. They're now at forty nine minutes which is still an industry best, right? Like they're like, I'm, th I'm thinking about their KPI and, and that must be one of their KPIs and picturing that kind of tick up and up over the years. And that's like, so that's clearly a, a problem, wow. right? The other interesting yeah. thing, and this, this relates to your cranberry story is they famously have used just a single type of airplane in their entire fleet, the Boeing 737, which was a huge advantage. It really simplifies their operations. But yep. we all know that Boeing has also been having some quality problems lately. And so, oh, yeah. and so that has now become a liability for them. They're getting far fewer planes than they had been expecting. And they're having yep. quality issues with their planes. So now they're having to rethink that whole strategy as well. Well, yeah, they moved their fleet over to the, what is the 787 MAX, 
which was designed to be like hyper economical, but had so many problems that like I think Boeing had to shut the line down. Oh wow! And Southwest mm-hmm. was left with a bunch of like planes they couldn't service anymore. Wow! That I... like. The FAA wouldn't allow him to fly. Yeah, it was a bigger deal. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, that's not even in the story here, but um, but great fact. The other really fun tidbit I noticed, so they're they're trying to think of ways to improve their operations, and one of them they, they said they're going to try to do is um, during boarding, they're going to play music at 120 beats per minute to try to get passengers to board more quickly. I thought that was great. That's really clever, right? Like, why not give it a try? Maybe you can psych some people into moving just a little bit, right? That's outside the box thinking, Bill. Yeah. Wow. The thing are you, the thing that I was going to say that I, I'm glad you didn't say. Speaking of cocktails, is that back when Southwest was starting, they would. You, the you know where I'm going with this. On. This was in the article. Yeah. They would, if you bought a ticket with Southwest, they would give you a bottle of whiskey. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't believe it's that was in the article. Apparently, they started when when other companies started trying to undercut their prices. They they started yeah. they, they'd keep the low price, but then they'd offer this extra yeah this this like I think they're twenty six dollar tickets instead of thirteen, yeah. and they just give you a bottle of booze, and it was really popular with the uh, the business travelers. Yeah, they became yeah. like the largest distributor of I think Jack Daniel's whiskey or whatever whiskey they were they were slinging. They became like the world's largest distributor of it. It was wild. Yeah. That's crazy. So, yeah. By the way, that's Good old my, Southwest. This has been a, yes, fortuitously, like this all came together. This was happy Thanksgiving, Matt. This was a very yes, Thanksgiving. happy Thanksgiving to you, Bill. What are you doing for your Thanksgiving? I am flying, actually. We are going to fly to our, to my wife's family in, uh, in Michigan. I know. They're on Wednesday, no less. Very Looking forward to Bless seeing the family. Family. they're wonderful people, not looking forward to getting there or or flying back. Absolute chaos. What are you up to? Worst thing to fly. Ugh. Yep. Good good luck. You're doing the whole spread. Turkeys, dressing, sweet potatoes. Yes. I, I don't I don't know. They're, so it her oh. family is is Persian actually. And so what I really look forward oh. to they'll, they'll probably do a traditional spread, but they'll they'll throw in some Persian stuff and what I'm looking for but Persians right. make the best candy. But best little sweets. They're like it's all it's all like slivered nuts with honey and rose water and saffron, yeah. just in various combinations. It is freaking amazing. The first time I went okay. there, like they just thought it was hysterical because I just couldn't stop eating the stuff. <laughs> so that's what I'm looking forward to. Turkey, forget it. Like mashed potato, I don't, I don't care. I want the Persian sweets. Candy. Yep. Candy, like like the grown man that you are. Give me the candy. Hundred percent. I haven't eaten Halloween candy since, uh, and I know you have too. So, so you can't like yes, the grown man you are also eating Twix, if I recall, taking all your kids' Twix. Yeah, they'll they'll never know what a Twix tastes like. That is my <laughs> goal. I will take them all. What are your Thanksgiving plans? We we have we are staying here in Dallas. We will be doing the full spread. So I have a turkey defrosting in my refrigerator right now. <clears throat> We've got we will have like four generations there. So my children's great grandmother will be there. She makes the best pies. We're very I am very excited. Awesome. I personally do not allow my family to celebrate like Christmas, listen to Christmas music, put up Christmas decorations until after the Thanksgiving meal. And they are all very excited to finally be able to like get in the Christmas spirit once dad has had his Thanksgiving. Nice. So there we go. That's what we're doing. All right. Well, listener, enjoy this wonderful podcast while hopefully while you're making your own turkey and thinking of the supply chain. I know Bill will be thinking about it. For the next year, at least. Absolutely. Happy Thanksgiving, Matt. Happy Thanksgiving, dear listeners. And um, we'll bullshit with you again later. Yeah. Thanks, Bill.